Hello, welcome to episode number 96 of the Photographing the West podcast. I'm your host, Kirby Flanagan. It's a pleasure to welcome back well-known wildlife photographer, Kevin Dooley. If you don't know Kevin, listen to podcast number 64 and get to know a great guy. He's a wonderful wildlife photographer. Today, we're going to talk about photographing Alaska coastal brown bears a cousin of the grizzly bears found in Yellowstone, the Tetons and Glacier. Stick around to the end when we review some of Kevin's wonderful images. Welcome back, Kevin. Well, thank you. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I got to admit that I don't know if there's any more, any subject I like better than talking about bears. They, uh, they're a huge fascination to me and certainly one of my very, very favorite animals to photograph. So I am absolutely honored to be here. Um, it's great to have you. Yeah, they're my favorite subject as well. So I guess we're on the same page there anyway. <laughs> so uh, what's the difference between Alaska coastal brown bears and grizzlies? Uh, Certainly. Um, so basically, they're all grizzly bears. You know, whether you're looking at the bears that are, as you said, you know, in Yellowstone or Montana or any of those places, um, the interior of Alaska, the coastal areas of Alaska, British Columbia, even in Russia. And so the biggest difference between a coastal brown bear and what most people would commonly know as a grizzly bear is their diet. And the coastal brown bears are still grizzly bears. They've just sort of taken on this nickname, so to speak, because they are the largest of all of the brown bears, or I'm sorry, all of the grizzly bears. So they still are a type of grizzly bear. However, their diet consisting more of salmon and in some cases, other types of fish, but primarily salmon, provides for the grizzly bears that live on the coast such a nutritional diet of both fat and protein that there are many days when they can put on nine pounds of weight a day. Mm. And so they basically have a diet that increases their their growth. They're, they're much larger bears. They're um, larger in both um, body size, head size, paws, everything about them is much larger. And again, it's, it's the nutrition. Now, when it comes to the coastal brown bears, which again are grizzly bears, there are various areas throughout Alaska and Canada where even they can vary in size. And the Kodiak bear, which is also a coastal brown bear, is the largest of the coastal brown bears. So if you take an interior grizzly bear, it can literally be 150, in some instances on a big boar or a big mallet, up to 200 pounds less in weight than a grizzly that lives on the coast, commonly known as a brown bear or a coastal brown bear. Does that sort of help with that? Does that answer that question for you? Yeah, it's great. Um, where are the best places to find brown bears in Alaska? Well, they they basically from you know the extreme end of the Aleutians all the way up the coastline, you're going to find those bears, and the various salmon runs will determine where the bears are located. And the different types of salmon will actually run or for, you know, you could say migrate at different times of the year throughout the warmer months. Anything from, you know, late June all the way into September, there'll be different types or different species of salmon that will be running in different areas. And the bears sort of specialize in feeding on salmon. And they may even specialize in a specific species of salmon, although they're gonna go for anything they can catch. And if one area, as an example, may be a good fishing area for sockeye salmon, 
but further up the river in another area might be better for silver salmon, those bears will move around a bit. And they will also follow those salmon from when they first start entering into the river system all the way up the rivers to where they're spawning. And once they get to their spawning area, the salmon will basically stop in that area, lay their eggs, and um, once they've laid their eggs, they begin to deteriorate. Well, they actually begin to deteriorate the second they, they hit the fresh water. As soon as their body goes into that shock of switching from salt water to fresh water, the salmon begin to deteriorate. But once they reach their spawning area, they've laid their eggs, very, very quickly, they're going to be dying. And the bears will follow those fish all the way up the river system until they end up in the spawning area. And that's where once they, the salmon are done there, a lot of times those bears will peel off away from the rivers and start feeding more on berries, uh, could be moose calves and various other types of food. They are omnivore, yeah, omnivores. So they'll eat everything from grass, you know, sedge grass to uh, different types of wild peas to flowers to insects and grubs to just anything they can find that they can eat throughout their entire time when they are leaving their hibernation until they re-enter hibernation, which will vary a little bit depending on the time and the area in Alaska would probably be in October could even be in the first week in November but the weather conditions will have a lot to determine that but the salmon will pretty much be spawned out you know the silver salmon are generally the last uh, species of salmon to run in Alaska and they will be spawned out as a general rule towards the end of September so the supply of fish that the bear are eating will start to become less and less as they work towards hibernation. So to answer your question in a nutshell, you can pretty much find them anywhere along the river system as long as there's salmon that are spawning and the bears will move from location to location following the fish. Sure. How do you get to these places where the bears are available to be photographed? Uh... Well, basically, most of these really good locations are going to require small planes. And, you know, every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say that, oh, yeah, I'm going to go on a cruise up to Alaska, and I hope to photograph some bears along the way. And, you know, they may get fortunate, and they may be able to see some bears along the way, or they may even be able to do a fly-out trip at some point on that type of an experience or that type of cruise. However, to really get to where the bears are, it often requires several nights at a remote location as well as a bush plane, a small plane, and flying into where the bears are located. We generally, we have two places that we go to uh, we go to, you know, the Katmai area, as well as the Lake Clark area. And those two areas, we have to fly in on small planes. We stay anywhere from five to seven days. And we have very good bear sightings. We know where the bears are at that time of the year. We know what the salmon are doing, in, you know, during those times. And, and, you know, listen, just like anything else, that can change a little bit. You know, like the salmon season could be a week or two late or a week or two early or whatever. But, but we've got it timed very well. And so you fly into Anchorage or maybe Fairbanks or, you know, um, wherever it is that you're going to start out at. And um, generally have to stay overnight in the city. Or, and then the next day you'll catch a float plane or a bush plane. And the difference is a float plane can land on a river or a lake. A bush plane lands on a beach or some sort of a runway. They've got big balloon tires. And basically that allows them to land in, in uh, areas that otherwise would be impossible to land in. And you take your plane into the area, take your gear. Get your uh, room set at the lodge, and off we go to photograph the bears. And one area we use boats, you know, so 
uh, we use boats to go up and down the river and we look for the bears along the river. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, then we will set up to photograph the bears, sometimes even photograph them from the boats, but generally we find them and set up in a place where, where they're gonna fish. And the other area we go to, we use four wheelers with trailers and we uh, go to where the bears are and get out, set up and spend the day with the bears as they fish and photographing them. So. Yeah, that uh, I did a fly into Katmai for a day trip, and uh, because uh, between the flights and uh, the lodge and everything is pretty expensive if you try to stay overnight, but it, it's definitely an advantage to be there more than one day or more than an hour or two. It definitely is. And you know what? You may be referring maybe to Brooks Falls or something like that. And right. um, Brooks Falls is actually a great location for a day trip. And, you know, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to photograph bears there. So the um, we don't, you know, we don't do overnight trips or anything like that at Brooks Falls. We go to different areas. But you're right. It can be a little bit expensive. You know, photographing bears, you know, for me personally, <clears throat> is way more than just photographing bears. You know, I love the bush plains. You know, I do a lot of writing, so I love to write. I love the mornings in Alaska. I love the the uh, the trees and the rivers and, you know, the other wildlife that you see. And so I'm, I guess I'm looking for an overall experience, a memory that I can hold on to for the rest of my life, and some time to to really get into it and you know, it may take a day or two even to sort of to sort of adjust and get some of those uh, those things that happen to you on a daily routine routine out of your head and just really, really get into what you're doing, where you are, what you're experiencing, and really take it in and make it a life changing experience. And and, and it's so much fun, you know, to sit around dinner at night and talk about the bears you've seen and to know the next morning you're going to head back out again and there's going to be some other great adventure. And, you know, the more days that you spend on the river or wherever it is that you're, you know, you're spending your time photographing the bears, the more it's going to increase your chances to see something unusual, maybe an argument between the bears, or maybe a bear trying to steal a fish from some cubs, or maybe even some cubs, you know, and so the longer you can spend out there, I think it's really worth the money to, to invest, so to speak, into a trip that is going to give you something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. And listen, a one day trip, if that's all you can afford, I still recommend doing it. It is it's so worth doing, but if there's a way you can pull off a long trip, it is just magic, absolute magic. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So uh, what, what gear do you use to photograph bears? Well, let me first start off by saying that, you know, obviously being careful is really important. You know, for some reason, bears have this reputation of being like vicious animals. And it almost breaks my heart to constantly see people riding things. I shouldn't say constantly, but people riding things about, you know, weren't you scared or, you know, gosh, bear, bears are so mean or so vicious or whatever. And, and I hate to, to read that because, you know, just like any other animal, you know, if you're careful and you keep your distance and you do things correctly, it's very safe to photograph bears. You just have to listen to the guides and do and follow the rules. And one of those rules is using a lens that's going to be able to reach out and, and photograph bears at a distance. And so I'm using a Sigma 60 to 600 and I end up shooting at 600 a good most of the time. I also use a Sigma 500 prime with a 1.4 converter. So that takes me out to 700. And I'm still having to crop images sometimes, you know, even at 700 millimeter, I will still end up cropping an image because I want a really nice portrait or a headshot of a bear. And so with those kind of telephoto reaches, you know, you can get some phenomenal images and still maintain a safe distance from the bears. 
I have been charged by a lot of animals in my life. You know, I've been uh, a registered or certified safari guide for many, many years. And um, the one animal I've never been charged by is a bear. <laughs> um, I've been charged by elephants. I've been charged by lions, rhinos, and other species. Never one time have I been charged by a bear. And I'm not saying that we're not careful because believe me, we are very careful. We really watch what we're doing, you know, because safety is the utmost concern. But um, I think bears deserve a fair shake and they're wonderful, wonderful animals to watch, to photograph, to study, to learn about. Just absolutely incredible and wonderful animals. Yes, they are. Yeah, they're amazing. And uh, I feel the same way. I love watching them as well as photographing them. They're, they're just wonderful, wonderful animals. So how do you approach the wild bears? You talked about safety. Uh, talk about that a little more. Well, you know, um, all animals have certain habitat or certain uh, displays that they do if they're feeling threatened or if they're not feeling threatened or if an animal is involved in a certain activity, you know, you know, basically, you know, where that animal's attention span is, what the animal's thinking about, what they're concentrating on. And so with bears, it's just really important to understand that you don't approach a female with cubs. Um, you don't approach a male that is aggravated. They make like almost like a clicking sound when they're aggravated. You watch how their ears are set. And, you know, when bears are fishing, they get very um, involved in what they're doing. They're, they're, they, they have one thing on their mind, and that's to catch fish and, and fatten up for the winter. And as long as you're not... Um, cornering them or you're not making them feel threatened you're really not interested in what you're doing you know and and when you when you're hiking if it, you know you make a little bit of noise so that they're aware that you're there the worst thing you can do is just throw a big surprise on a bear and, and um, if, if you surprise a bear and he's alerted you know instantaneously then then that could present a problem so you just have to make sure the bears are aware that you're there you maintain a stance that is not aggressive or overbearing and let the bears know that everything is fine you know and and again i'm not saying you should get within an unsafe distance don't misunderstand me i'm just saying that all of those things combined and a really good guide and going with people that know what they're doing will all make for a safe journey. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my experience with my limited experience with bears uh, is uh, summed up by a quote from a friend of mine that uh, uh, photographing bears is like watching grass grow. <laughs> yeah. Usually they're eating yeah, I mean, you, there's certainly times when, you know, there, it's just like fishing. Like when you go out fishing, you know, there's times when you catch fish and there's times when you're fishing and, and not catching fish. And so, you know, that's true with bears as well. But, um, you know, the nice thing about that is it leaves time for you to have time with yourself. And when do we really get an opportunity to have time with ourselves, to think about our life, to think about, you know, what we're up to, what we're doing, our future, whatever the case may be, you know, if the bears are laying there sleeping, then it, you know, obviously you want to keep one eye on the bear and make sure that you know where he's at, but it's a really great opportunity just to spend quiet time in the wild to, to get to know yourself and, and to, to learn how beautiful your life actually is. And so that's one of the things I love to do. And uh, there's one lodge we, that we use in July. And, you know, I'm an early riser. And um, so in July, you know, it's going to be light at 4.30 in the morning and it's going to be dark at you know, after midnight, maybe 12.30 at night. And so I wake up at five in the morning and the rest of the camp seems to still be asleep. And it gives me so much opportunity just to sit on the deck of my cabin and watch the river 
And I'll even see bearers sometimes from right from the cabin and, you know, do some writing. You know, I like to listen to uh, scriptures. So I might listen to some motivational scriptures and or some of my favorite music and just really take a moment to enjoy life because we don't get a lot of opportunity for that these days. And those bears have given me some wonderful opportunities to enjoy my life. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, our lives are all crazy with everything going on, especially this year. So uh, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, without a doubt. And by the way, we did do bear trips this year. Uh, we did Africa too, but Africa, we were back in the U.S. by um, – well, my groups were back in the U.S. by mid-March. Um, I was there until the end of April. But just the same, um, I found the traveling actually to be really easy. When I went to Anchors this year, you know, I did have to get a COVID test. And um, got the test, went up there, everything was fine. Nobody got sick. I found the flights to be very, um, everybody was very cautious. They wore their masks. You know, I, I actually didn't really find it to be an uncomfortable uh situation at all and obviously everybody you know i'm not encouraging people to go out and fly if they're not comfortable but i will tell you that nobody on any of my trips got sick um we i don't know it was it, it seemed like there was a lot of build up to something that went a lot easier than what i had anticipated it would so oh, so maybe there's good. some light at the end of the tunnel here <laughs> yeah let's hope so all right, so uh, what makes an interesting bear photograph, would you say? Well, for me personally, there are two different types of bear images that I'm searching for. One of them is the bear performing some sort of activity that is interesting for a viewer to look at. The other one is for a bear to have some sort of expression, both in their body position or their you know, they're, they're, uh, how they're sitting or standing, body language, or within the expression on their face. And you got to remember that we as human beings are, you know, we relate to human expressions, right? So if you see an animal and, you know, he has some sort of an expression that you can relate to as a human expression, then you get something from that photograph. You know, even though the bear may not necessarily mean that, you can relate to a human expression. And so bears make a lot of expressions. They make expressions with their ears, even their mouths, their eyes. They do have small eyes. And that's one very difficult thing about photographing bears is, that, is how small their eyes are. But um, how they tilt their head, whether they're facing towards you, facing away from you, all of that body language creates expression. And so, I'm looking for either a bear that's going to show expression that the viewer can relate to and wants to explore, or I'm looking for a bear that is performing some sort of an activity, such as fishing, running, um, jumping, uh, standing on his hind legs, something that is going to draw that viewer into that photograph and make them say, oh man, what is that bear doing? Well, that's pretty cool. I want to explore that. Because basically, you know, people are exposed to thousands of photographs daily. And so yeah. if you can find a way in your photograph to stop them in their tracks long enough for them to really take a good look at your photograph, then you have really been successful with your image. You can do that through providing a activity that the animal is doing or providing an expression that's going to grab the viewer's attention. Yeah, all and good points. So... Um, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some of your bear photos and talk about. Uh... So this particular photograph that uh, you're seeing now, and can you see it okay, Kirby? Yes, I can. Excellent. This particular image, basically, this is a younger male bear. Okay, I'm going to put this youngster at about four years old, could even be three years old. Um, you know, when they get to be around two years old, they, the mom kind of kicks them out of the house, you know? And, uh, so this guy is getting big enough where he's a very formable bear, but yet he was trying to steal fish from other bears that were catching the fish. 
And so that bear that you see behind that's chasing this bear is a large female or what we would call a sow bear. This youngster, this sow bear had two cubs and this youngster would wait for her to catch a fish and take it to the babies. And then uh, she would go back to try to catch another fish and he would make a beeline for those cubs to try to steal their fish. And, um, and he had pretty good success with it actually. But at, at any rate, if the mom saw him, he would go for this guy. And uh, we had many opportunities to photograph this mom going for this youngster. And so here, I've, I've taken a very low camera angle. I am literally laying on the beach with my chin in the sand so that I can give that bear the presence that he deserves by making him look large and giving him all the, you know, all the uh, honor that he deserves. And so I'm, I think I could have even shot this at 600 millimeter, but it's compressed because of the telephoto lens. And you can see that the mom is just slightly falling out of focus. I have a tendency to, to photograph my bear images at uh, 7.1 or even wider. And so I want all my attention to be going on my subject. And a fast shutter speed is absolutely vital in these situations because these bears can really move fast. And so chances are, I was, I'm not looking at the, uh, the data right now, but generally with these bears, I'm shooting at 1,000 to 1,250, sometimes even faster. Okay. And so let me go ahead and I'm going to stop that share. And uh, I'm going to bring up another image. Let me find one here that you guys will enjoy. This one looks like a fun one. How far away were these uh, bears that were charging each other? I mean, 50 yards. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to share another image with you guys. So, <coughs> pardon me. I'm just going to get a quick drink of water here. So these are different bears, and um, you know, uh, this one bear uh, that's got the fish in its mouth had caught a fish, and the other bear saw it and just came in and just just mauled that bear. And um, basically what he's trying to do is roll him over onto his back so that that bear does not have any advantage. And um, when I photograph this type of a situation or this type of a scene, I'm basically, you know, photographing on multi um, shutter. And actually, I photograph bears always on multi shutter anyway. And I use a Canon 1DX Mark III at this point, which, you know, is giving me approximately 12 frames a second. So I'm able to cover this entire sequence of events. Um, and so, it's really, really exciting to get these kind of images. And, you know, the bears are growling and making all kinds of noise. And, you know, it's almost like it's almost overwhelming. And uh, as the years progress, I get better and better at this because it's so awesome to see that sometimes I, I might forget to even take the picture. But at any rate, um, this particular situation, she spit the, fair, uh, the fish out and the other bear eventually got it. So let me um, take you back now, and we will go. So were those siblings, or were they? Uh, uh, no, actually, they weren't. But one of the nice things about photographing bears that are fishing is you end up getting a lot of bears that are arguing over the same fishing area, because certain areas will work better for these bears, You know, whether it be the shallowness of the water or how the river comes together. So a lot of things that attract bears to a specific fishing area, which increases their chances of being able to get something. Now, one of the things I love to do, and this is a cub, is I love to still try to frame bears with other subjects. And it's a little trickier, you know, when uh, they're out in the open, but these seagulls are a wonderful opportunity to frame bears. And it's, it's tricky to do because you have to kind of wait for everything to line up, but it's so much fun to use the seagulls to tell the story, to, um, you know, provide a natural frame around the cub's head. And, um, you know, in a situation like this, I still would like to maintain keeping the seagulls 
how to focus because I don't want it to become confusing between the seagulls and the bear. So the bear being my main subject, the seagulls being secondary in the image. And um, I'm sure that I shot this at probably 7.1. Me, yeah, the uh, seagulls love to be around when the bears are fishing so they can uh, pick up the pieces, I think. Oh, they do. Yeah, they are like, uh, the minute they see the bears fishing, they flock in big numbers because they know that there is a big opportunity there for them to uh, to get some food. So, And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I love about nature is how it all works hand in hand. You know, semi uh what is it, semibiosis or whatever it's called, where the different species will actually work together to create food for each other. And um, se semibiotics, anyway, I can't remember what it's called. I have to look it up. But at any rate, um, I'm not sure if the birds are providing anything for the bear, but the bear is definitely providing for the bird. So. Right. Okay, let me just... Uh, so you've been looking at all these action photos and let me just pull up a sun sunrise shot real quick. And then I want to try to find an image that is going to give you more um, where we were talking about, you know, expression within the animal. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. This is kind of a sort of in, in between because, you know, the bear is not necessarily being super active. And so it's more or less putting an animal into a landscape. But uh, in this particular area, we have to do these photographs at sunrise because sunset, uh, the, the sun goes down behind the mountain on the other side and you just can't get anything out of it. And so we go out, you know, and this is from our September trips and it starts to get a little chilly, but you have to pretty much lay in the muck and get a super low camera angle because otherwise I would have had that horizon line of the mountains going through the bear's face. And obviously we don't want that. We want that bear's head to stand on its own. So getting a super, super low camera angle and uh, just waiting it out until the bear gets in the right position. Obviously I've exposed for the sky and not the bear. So I'm letting the bear go into a silhouette and I'm getting a correct exposure of the light behind the bear. Picking up the reflection in those little bits of water in front of the bear was also a, sort of a nice uh, environmental bonus that God gave me on that day, I guess you could say, because uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's certainly nice when you get those little extra bits to help you enhance a photograph. And uh, this is actually one of my favorite images from that trip because that is totally a real sunrise. It's not you know, enhanced or added in a way that I've added clouds or anything like that. That's the real deal. And uh, anyway, so that's that's uh, obviously, you know, placing the animal within the landscape and picking up the emotion of the colors and the squirrels in the sky and the sunrise and, you know, just what it's like to be with that bear first thing in the morning. Yeah, that's so, a spectacular sunrise, I have to say. Thank you. We... Uh, we were seven nights on that trip and basically uh, got, we photographed the sunrise every single morning except for one morning where um, it was just the weather was just, it was not giving us a good sunrise. It was really just a gray blah, you know, rain, which you get in Alaska. And so it was kind of almost pointless for us to, to go out that morning. I'm looking for one specific image here. Uh, here we quest go. Question. Uh, so uh, how do you uh, dress to crawl around in the muck? <laughs> yeah, well, that is a very good question. And I'll answer that while you're looking at this next image. Uh, and this is an one. image where we're going for expression, right? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at, you know, you can see there's, there's just so much expression in this bear. And if you're going to get a really good portrait type image, then you need to make sure that it's not just bland, that there is a bit of expression going on and it's gonna pull that viewer right into that photograph. So as far as how we dress, um, I wear you know, chest waders, which are obviously a rubber sort of suit that goes all the way up to my chest. I wear wading boots, so all of that's keeping me dry from my chest down. And then I'm wearing a raincoat and um, 
basically I put into my pockets some lint-free cloths and I put those in Ziploc baggies because inevitably, inevitably when I, I lay on the ground, um, I do end up getting sand on my camera. Sometimes it gets wet and things like that. And so um, I want to have the ability to be able to clean it off quickly. And um, those lint-free cloths work great, but I do keep them in a, a Ziploc baggie. So that way if my hands get wet and I end up putting my hands in my pockets or whatever, I'm still keeping those lint-free cloths dry and clean. You, you just, when you lay down out there, you, you just get wet. It's just, I mean, well, you don't personally, but your clothing gets very wet. And another thing I think is really important is to, when you buy rain gear, is to make sure that it goes down below your waist. Um, but between waders, hip waders, and a raincoat, you're basically completely uh, insulated from the moisture. So I don't like to shoot with gloves on. And so unless I absolutely have to, I keep my hands without gloves or a lot of times if I absolutely need them, I'll use the mittens where I can put a finger out. Um, I just I don't enjoy shooting where I can't actually feel things on the back of my camera with my finger. So. That's a great gesture with that uh, left uh, front paw. Yeah, and that's how we were talking about before about the body language. You know, yep. the body language of the bear um, is, you know, it's it's everywhere. It's like I was saying, leaning forward, leaning back. You know, here, paw coming forward. You know, how the t head is tilted, where the eye is set within the eye socket. You know, the tilt of the head. All of those things are going to make a difference. So. I'll bring up one more image for you guys. Let's see, I'm going to stop that share and go back and let's see um, what we've got here. One of the other nice things about photographing bears is that you will sometimes get opportunities, you know, to find other species to photograph, whether it be foxes or eagles or anything like that. And I want to bring up this next image and I want to explain to you how important it is to always be prepared to photograph at a fast shutter speed because you never know you know you may be doing a headshot of an animal and think oh yeah you know i'm okay at you know 400th of a second or whatever and uh, all of a sudden that animal just jumps into action and this is a prime example of that i photographed this fox and um, he was just sitting there and i was photographing him and Bam, he's like picks up this, you know, decaying salmon and jumps over this little uh, little canal or whatever you want to call it. And fortunately, my shutter speed was set at a fast enough shutter speed that I was able to still stop that motion. And so you just never know. And this is actually a low res image. So um, it's going to have a little bit of quality loss here as you look at it now. But at any rate, um, you just never know when these animals are going to do something that's really awesome. And I can't tell you how many times I've like kicked myself in the butt or felt disappointed because, you know, I, I was either not paying attention or I didn't have my camera on a fast enough shutter speed and something amazing happened and you miss it, you know, and those moments are few and far between. I mean, I got to say in my whole lifetime, I've never seen a fox jumping across a little canal with a salmon in his mouth. And had I missed the shot, I would have been pretty disappointed. Yeah, I guess so. That's an amazing shot. So, anyway. All right. Yeah, ironically enough, this image was actually shot at a little bit of a distance. Um, really? I personally, uh, I believe I shot this at 400 millimeter or something like that. But um, I was down low. And, I guess so. And the bear was also even higher up again. He wasn't even level with me. So it really worked out nicely to show the power of this particular bear. And um, he was just walking along the beach when I shot this image. Um, those are two, actually a mom and two cubs behind him in between his legs there. So I basically took several shots of this bear walking along and um, was able to, uh, this is one of my favorite photographs that I actually got this year. And yep. again, it's all about perspective of, you know, a low camera angle. 
Another thing that really gives us bare perspective is where his head is in comparison to the mountain behind him. So people will automatically think a mountain, you know, that's a really big thing. It's a really tall thing. And by lining his head up, um, even higher than the peak of the mountain, it also gives that bear the perspective of being just massively large. Yeah, sure does. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I lo- actually really am proud of this shot. So. Uh, as well, you should be. <laughs> so how far away were you from this bear? Uh, I don't know, quite a ways, probably 40, 50 yards, something like that. Wow. Is this crop then? or It is crop, yeah. Okay. But yeah. remember, it's a strong lens, too. It's a telephoto lens, and it's a full-body shot. So so uh, how do you stay safe laying on the ground with uh, bears wandering around you? Um, well, you keep your distance. <laughs> and you also, um, there's guides there that are watching, and you watch what direction the bear is walking in. You know, this is, you can see by looking at this bear, he's not even interested in me. It's not walking towards me or anything. He's just walking past me. So if he started heading straight towards me, then I would, would be moving. (laughs) (laughs) So, but yeah, I love this shot. So imagine the bear can sprint faster than you can though, huh? Um, bears, oh yeah, bears can definitely run faster than humans. But again, you know, we're, we, we, we're trying to, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to maintain safety and respect the bears and everything, but we also don't want people to think that bears are just these killer animals, you know? Right. So, and again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be careful of bears because they obviously can be dangerous, but we also don't want to, um, you know, give them a reputation that's not deserved. So, um, always makes big headlines when somebody is attacked, even if uh, they were doing something stupid to uh, to get an attack. Exactly, and and unfortunately, you know, and I think more people have been attacked by mountain lions in the last couple of years than bears. But it's just you know, it's sensational news. It's just like any other kind of news. You know, um, if they can word it in a way and add sensation to it, know it's going to get a lot of a lot of readers looking at it and they're going to do whatever they need to do to be successful with that, you know? And I mean, who's not going to look at an article that says, you know, somebody was attacked by a bear. It's just, you get drawn to it, you know? Yeah. I, think there, I think there's more people that die from bee stings and then die from bear well, attacks. Yeah. That's actually a very valid point. And, you know, I'm going to show you another image here. Okay. And um, the reason why I'm going to show it to you is because it is completely opposite of everything that you and I are talking about right now. And I just want people to, I just want to make sure that, you know, people love our wildlife and don't get, you know, that it doesn't get them the wrong impression. So (laughs) obviously two cubs um, exploring each other, um, actually learning how to, to deal with um, interactions with other bears. And uh, this is a, I actually think it's a a brother and a sister. When they're this young, sometimes it's hard to to tell whether they're male or female, but um, my best bet is a male and a female. And um, they're basically, you know, learning how to deal with encounters of other bears as they grow older. So it's an exciting time, you know, and, and, uh, I mean, what, how beautiful is that? You know, yeah, that's delightful. So, and that actually was shot on us at 700 millimeter. That's actually probably more like 75 to a hundred yards away. But okay. Anyway. Well, you've had some wonderful experiences there. I, I envy you. Um, I absolutely, absolutely love <laughs> Uh, photographing bears and I absolutely love what I do and uh, it is certainly a highlight in my life and I couldn't imagine spending my life doing anything else it um, gives me so much joy that it's not even funny so speaking of that uh, what are your plans for uh, 2021 
Um, well, we'll be in Alaska uh, twice. We'll be, um, I, I've got the busiest 2021. Uh, it'll be the busiest year I've ever had. So we'll be doing India, Brazil. Uh, we've got, I think, 12 or 14 safaris in Africa. And um, so I'll be gone. I'll be traveling a lot next year. In addition to the safari, the new safaris that we're doing, we're also, we had a few safaris that we had to move to next year because we weren't able to travel in some instances this year. And so we are very filled up next year. So busy, busy, busy. I hope to get, I'll, I'll be getting a lot of images next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sounds very busy for sure. So uh, where can people find your photos and your tours and all those sorts of things? Well, my website is, um, it's adubephotosafaris.com. So um, you would pronounce it like I do B, but it's spelled I D U B E. Again, that's I D U B E photo P H O T O safaris, S A F A R I S.com. I do be photosafaris.com. I'm also on Facebook under Kevin Dooley. Um, I, I unfortunately don't have any friend, any more friend requests available, but people can follow me and they can also follow me on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is also under I do be photo safaris. Um, I've got a YouTube channel where we talk a lot about, uh, you know, techniques and gear and that's also under I do be photo safaris. Again, it's I D U B E P H O T O S A F A R I S. I do be photo safaris. Okay, so. sounds good. Well, thanks for a great podcast, Kevin. It's uh, been a real pleasure talking to you and looking at your photographs. So, hope we can do this again sometime. Well, the pleasure is certainly all mine, and. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to, you know, to share some wildlife and some ideas and uh, to encourage people. Uh, gosh, you know, if you have the opportunity to get out there and photograph wildlife, it is a stunning and very rewarding experience. And it never grows old because unlike other types of photography, these animals never stop doing things that are just amazing, unexpected. And there's always another image on your bucket list that you want to go for. It's a lovely, lovely experience. Absolutely. So. Well, let me do my wrap up here. So uh, the audio podcast can be found on my website and iTunes and many of the popular RSS feeds as Photographing the West. The video version can be found on my website at www.flaniganphotos.com, spelled F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. F-O-T-O-S. We're here on the 15th and 30th of each month with new, with new episodes where I do interesting interviews with interesting people, most of them photographers. Bye for now, and we'll be back soon.